Yes. <clears throat> so uh, my name is uh, Christian. Uh, I'm Danish, but I'll be talking in English, so uh, that we can link what I'll be saying with what Michelle said. Um, my idea today is to talk about open culture um, in general, but also talk about Creative Commons, the concept of Creative Commons licensing in particular. And uh, I'm going to try, like, I'm going to explain to you what Creative Commons is, how to use it, and in the end I have some examples of how it's being used uh, in many different areas of society. And also I've uh, uh, specifically in the end found some examples within the library, uh, the library business. Uh, so I'm hoping that in the end maybe we can have a, a session where you actually uh, engage and we have a dialogue. Because I think this is really, really interesting to discuss. And um, so uh, let's, see, uh, let's see how that goes. Um, my background is very diverse. Um, like uh, like uh, Nils said, uh, it's, um, I do all, many different uh, kinds of things. Uh, I call myself a bootstrapper, which is basically uh, a concept or a slang word that describes uh, an entrepreneur that doesn't have a budget. So you strap on your boots and, uh, and you try to develop ideas uh, without uh, being uh, limited by not having uh, funds available. Uh, that being said, however, of course, I, some of the things I do, I do for a pay. But as you can see up here, these are some of the projects that I'm involved in right now. And most of them are volunteer, on a volunteer basis. Uh, and the reason why I do all these things is because I'm really interested in these things. So to connect with what so, uh, some of the things that Michelle talked about, um, like the motivation for doing things does not have to be monetary. Um, at least not in my perspective. And it doesn't have uh, to be monetary from a, a sustainable point of view for me as a person and how to make a living. And I'll get back to that a little later. But um, just to describe really brief what I spend most time doing right now, uh, since this is also a hack lab, I would like to emphasize this project called Platform 4, uh, which I'm, um, I'm part of, of developing. It's a art and technology venue of North and Denmark in, in Aalborg. Um, it's been running for three years and uh, contains an a, a emerging hackerspace. Um, right now we've established a new space right next to it called Formula. You can also see that on the screen. Um, which is a, a, a makerspace, a place where people can actually develop their projects together and individually. Um, based on a, 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 a premise of collaboration and uh, interest. Like these are mostly volunteer projects, but sometimes they grow into actually being something that people can make a career out of. So I spend a lot of time with Platform 4 and Formula to try to facilitate uh, a platform where people can develop their ideas. Uh, this is often something that students are really attracted by. Uh, like so using their spare time to develop something. And we have software developers sitting here uh, in, in these two spaces, developing uh, mostly open source software. It's not limited to that, unfortunately. But uh, we try to make things open for everybody. Um, also, I spend a lot of time uh, promoting and working voluntarily for Creative Commons, which is a, a global organization that provides these licensing tools for people, free of charge, um, and really easy to use. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, primarily, um, and explain to you how these things actually work, and also from a, a, an economical point of view, how uh, they actually, like the, the, the sharing uh, the base that, that is the fundamental, uh, the fundamental trait of Creative Commons licensing, how that can actually work in a societal perspective. Uh, on a side note, I also run a record label, which I'm going to use as a case in one of the examples, uh, using Creative Commons licenses in a music perspective, which is something that is often debated with a piracy, uh, uh, the piracy, piracy discussions and everything. So more about that later. That's the one called Will Out. 
<sighs> but to begin with, in order to you know, just describe um, my approach uh, to explaining uh, Creative Commons licenses to you, I would like to talk first about sharing. Uh, you can see all these uh, logos for social media services that you probably know, at least some of them. Because, uh, as you all know, the internet has changed over the last years. You've all heard the, all heard the term uh, Web 2.0 or the social internet. Um, and and you, know, that you all probably know that means that things are now interactive uh, as compared to the first internet, which was mostly one-way communication. So nowadays, what we do is, uh, when we use the internet, is, um, is interact with others. Uh, and that's, uh, that's obvious to anyone. But what I think is really interesting is also that, uh, or is also <coughs> how we actually interact with each other. Because all these social media tools that we use every day, like Facebook, for instance. Imagine how much time is being spent on Facebook. And um, what we're actually doing is sharing things about ourselves, as well as sharing things about others. Um, but when we do that, we also often share uh, things that we ourselves have created or that somebody else has created. So there's not a distinct border between writing uh, a status update about what you had for dinner, and sharing uh, this little uh, video bit that you did with your telephone. Like, the distinction between what we share is not really clear. And that is also why it's very confusing, especially for the young generation, to distinguish between what kind of sharing is legal and what kind of sharing is illegal. Because what we're actually doing when we interact with each other in the, in the social web is actually uh, exchange knowledge. Um, and that exchange is what actually binds us together. Like imagine a Facebook or a Twitter without, uh, without people <laughs> or without people sharing. Like the tool itself is worth nothing. And the fact that we're there is, from a point of view, not really important either. The important thing is that we write something. That we actually put you know, some content into it. And that content ranges from everything, you know, from what we do right now to, you know, sounds, video, anything that, you know, interests us at this, uh, this given moment. And that's because nowadays technology is so cheap, you know. It's so cheap nowadays to actually produce video or to write something and publish or to make music. Like, if you download the Pro Tools, and put it on a MacBook or any laptop computer, you can pretty much make music to a sta or on a standard that is close to what a professional studio can do. I'm not saying that it's the same, but to the layman, it can be hard to tell the difference of what has been produced in a professional music studio <coughs> and in the home of a really talented young person, like a songwriter. Uh, so technology is cheap, and uh, that has also uh, made a, a significant, another significant change in the way that we interact with each other. Because the border between who is the creator and who is the audience is blurring. Like nowadays, um, when we share, it's uh, just as often something that we could do to ourselves, like taking a picture or, or you know, yeah, shooting some video or writing some text. So, that we don't necessarily see ourselves only as an audience anymore, but rather as an audience and a creator. So, you know, technology has enabled us uh, to do that. So, uh, so a lot of, you know, quality content comes from, from amateurs. People, like Michelle mentioned, that produce uh, content, not uh, to make a living from it, but simply because they want to, because it's fun, and because we are humans and we are creative. So we produce things and we share them. <coughs> um, so that brings us to the, to, the, to the challenge. Because now that we start sharing all these things and people start sharing what we produce, so what happens if somebody starts 
you know, to use our material for commercial purposes, like to make money on something that we produced. Um, for, for like for decades, um, that or over a hundred years ago, that was also a problem. We started uh, to consider, you know, what are we going to do about this? The fact that when we produce something, uh, we want to make sure, and we, I'm, I'm talking about we as a society, we want to make sure that nobody exploits this, uh, this material without uh, compensation for, for, for the person that created it. And that's how the idea, the concept of copyright came about. So basically, copyright um, is a legislation on a global scale in each country that protects uh, your rights as a creator and makes sure that anybody who wants to use your material uh, in any way will have to ask you for permission. That means that uh, whatever you create, people will have to ask you for a commission if they want to use it, but sometimes if you are a creator, you can assign um, those rights to a company, for instance, if you are a musician, <coughs> to a record company or a publishing agency, so that they will you know, mass produce whatever you created and distribute it in some way, on a CD or in a book or you know, whatever the format is, and then they will actually uh, take care of the of collecting the, the compensation, like they are giving those who purchase the book, or the CD, or the DVD, uh, a license to use that product in their home, and they charge money for that. <coughs> um, so basically, we have a situation where you can either uh, purchase this uh, product and earn the license to use it in your home, uh, or you need to contact the person who, who made it. Uh, and that poses some problems. For instance, if you yourself, uh, you know, are Japanese and the person that, uh, whose product you would like to use is Belgian, then you have a language problem. You also have a problem of how do I actually contact that person? That can be quite difficult. Like, just send an email or do I, uh, you know, call them or whatever. So, in a way, it, it becomes really hard to obtain the right to use something with the current system because everything is per default, uh, every use is per default illegal. Like copyright uh, creates a full protection of any kind of use. Um, and in that sense, it's very contrary to what we talked about just before. Talked about how we share. That is the new reality that we live in. We want to share things, and we do share things, because it's natural. Technology has enabled us to produce all these things and share them with the world and also enjoy what everybody else is creating. But we have the, the copyright that is actually preventing you from doing that or making it illegal. Some people do it anyway, but you know, that's a, a big, a big uh, uh, problem and a big challenge for copyright uh, as a concept. Um, so that's one thing, like the problem of copyright as a concept. The second thing is that, as a creator, one of the joys of making something is that other people will actually see it, or you know, consume it, or whatever, like uh, that they will actually have access to it. So what if you as a creator uh, would actually like people to do what they do in sharing? <coughs> but you, even if the law by default gives you full copyright, that's the way it is, you don't have to you don't have to apply for copyright, that's given to you automatically. But what if you as a creator, even of just taking some holiday photos, that you would actually like the, your friends or you know, the web in general to enjoy these, these products, like this, this, uh, this content that you created, then, you actually, then we actually have a problem because the copyright <laughs> uh, makes that illegal. Like people will have to ask you beforehand uh, if they want, if, if they can actually use it, and so uh, so you know it's it's, it's uh, contrary to to what you might actually want to do with this uh, this material. Um, also, what the web is really good at uh, for artists 
is also to, to create attention for what these artists produce. And I'm talking about artists, again, as something that is not necessarily professional, but something like the new world where the line between audience and creator is blurred. I think we're all artists in that sense. Uh, and I think a lot of us would appreciate if somebody else would pick up something that we created, remixing it or spreading it in their part of the world. Um, and you know, telling people that I made that, that is something I think a lot of creators would like. And also something that, which I'll show you later, can be used in a business model, where you actually see the internet as a huge resource. Like the fact that, that people want to give attention to what something you create. Uh, even if they are, are able to do that uh, easily and under an open license, you can still build a business on that. I'll get back to that. But this willingness to want to share with the world that stands in contrast to the way copyright uh, law is at the moment uh, is a big problem. And this is where the concept of creative commons licensing comes in. Because creative commons licensing uh, is a way to get the best of both worlds. The idea is that with a creative commons license, you waive certain rights. These rights, like we're talking about how all rights are protected by copyright. <coughs> But you might actually, as a creator, want to waive some of those rights. Say, I don't, yeah, like, if a person in, in, uh, in Japan wants to play my song home, he doesn't have to ask first, and he doesn't have to pay me or a record company. I would like him to, you know, be able to use my, my material without having to send me an email or, uh, you know, call me or, I don't speak Japanese, so, you know, that's the problem, right? Um, so how about if I put a label on my song, or on my book, or my you know, film, or my software, a label that says you can use this in your home, but I would actually uh, keep the right to get paid if somebody wants to pick up my book, song, movie, etc., and make money from it, like if the person in Japan is actually running a TV station or radio or something. How about if I put a label that everybody knows how to read because it's not in Danish, it's not in Japanese, it's universal. Um, that would be smart. And this is what Creative Commons is about. <clears throat> creative Commons is a label that you put on your <coughs> produce to uh, explain to people across the, the globe how they can use it for free without asking for permission and how they, or what they need to pay for. Uh, like what kinds of use they have to pay for. And these, like these universal logos that I'm going to explain to you how it works, they are uh, translated and ported, we call it, into uh, over 80 countries right now. So it's a universal license. So it works across borders, like the internet does, which the copyright doesn't. So the idea with the Creative Commons license is to uh, interact with uh, the world and actually be able to bridge the gap of language and uh, copyright law and so forth. In practice, like what do, you, what, do you, what do you do in practice to use a Creative Commons license? Like to put on this explanation is really easy. And I'm actually going to show you how to do it on the, on the website. Uh, but you can see this example from uh, Vimeo of a random video. But in, a, in the corner, there are these, I really have to see it. I hope you can make it out. There are these round symbols that explain to me, finding this video, what I can do for free without asking for permission and what I would need to compensate the creator uh, for. Um, and these logos, here they are, a little bigger, are in fact the Creative Commons license <coughs> uh, You can see there are different, different ones, and I'm going to explain to you, to you what they do. Um, but here you can see six different kinds of combinations. And this is referred to as the Creative Commons license suite. 
these are the options creators, regardless of what you're creating, uh, can use to put on your product and signal to the world, show the world what you, what you can and what you cannot do. Um, the first one, you can see, <coughs> is the attribution icon, which is uh, the person. And this, going back, is in all the six combinations. Um, this means, attribution means, that any use, like any one of these uh, uh, licenses, um, when using them, you have to make sure to mention who made this, uh, this produce, this, uh, this creation. Give credit to that person. The next one, which is the dollar sign with a, uh, with a line over it, is the non-commercial icon. And this is, this is perhaps, uh, from a business point of view, uh, the most interesting because when adding the, the non-commercial uh, icon to your product, you tell the world that anyone can use it uh, for a non-commercial purpose for free, but if you want to broadcast, if you want to reproduce, if you want to distribute, then you have to pay the creator. Um, the third one is called no derivatives. And as you can see, going back into the overview, we have it in number three and number six. By adding this icon to your product, you can uh, explain to the world uh, whether you would want the world to actually make uh, other works based on parts of your work. Uh, this is what is commonly referred to as sampling, for instance, in music. Like, take a little piece of something and then, you know, put it into something that you're creating. This is common practice, like being inspired by things or taking a little bit and using it for something else is very common. So you can either allow people to do that or you can uh, do the opposite and say, okay, you still have to ask me if you want a sample. So that's the third one. The fourth one, and that's the last, um, is this one, which is called share alike. This is uh, the icon that you add to a work if you want to make sure that the person using a sample or uh, the full, uh, the full uh, creation um, when creating something new can <coughs> use the same license as the one you use. So this is, this is, very, uh, uh, this is the same uh, ideology as behind, uh, that lies behind open source that you, when you create something and you give it to the commons, <coughs> then you uh, want to make sure that what is produced uh, you know, based on that is also given to the commons. So that's the one called share alike. And these, these uh, icons are really easy to, to put on your product and it's free and it's something that makes your work accessible to the world in a way that people understand across the globe. So, let's skip forward. The way to do that as a creator is that you go online onto the Creator Commons website and press the button called License My Work. You don't have to register. You don't have to get a permission. This is something that you go in and, and also generate the icon you, you generate on the site based on the, 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 the particular license that you want on your product. And um, then it uh, outputs an icon that you can put on either a digital product like the video we saw, or also printed on the back of your book, or your album, or whatever you're producing. And it's that easy. So, uh, the icons is uh, human code. Like, the icons is something that people understand when you look at the back of the DVD, and you see these icons, and you know what they mean, then you know what you can do, what you can't do. But there's actually an added, uh, added bonus of using the Creative Commons license because uh, nowadays uh, the human reading of code is only a small portion of what goes on on the internet. The, 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 by far the biggest part of what goes on on the internet is computers reading code. So what is actually um, um, in the co uh, in the, the in the icons in the, the the license that you download 
is also metadata, which is readable for computers. So when you add a Creative Commons license to your product, then you also add some code that computers can understand, search engines. I don't know if you know this, but if you go onto Google and press advanced search, scroll all the way down, it's kind of hard to find, but it's there. Then you can actually search only for openly licensed material, which is awesome because if you as a creator want to use pictures in a presentation or want to find music to sample or even music <coughs> to use in your film, you can find openly licensed music that you can use without, uh, without direct compensation then you can actually use a search engine for that. And this is great also for creators because adding this code to your work makes your product or your creation searchable for the internet. Like the huge repository of data on the internet right now is so vast that it's, you know, where to start? If you didn't have search engines, it would be useless. So by adding the metadata, which is automatically layered in the, in the license, then you actually make your work uh, searchable and, and enable people to find it uh, when they search for, for openly licensed material. And how is that a, uh, an advantage? I'll give you some examples in a minute. Before going into the examples, I just want to show you a little about uh, the scale of Creative Commons licensing. Um, hope you can make out the numbers, but as you can see, over the last few years, it's a uh, uh, exponentially rising uh, curve. I unfortunately don't have the numbers for 2010, but I would imagine that I heard it's something around 500 million works being licensed under CC uh, within pictures, films, music, etc. So this, this is a huge repository, a huge resource of information. This is the, the comments, this is information that you can actually used to share that that is not illegal to to uh, to you know use in the way that is normal with the social media services and all this <coughs> yes okay so that was the explanation of what creative commons is and how to use it now i'd like to show you some examples of how it has been used in different uh, parts of uh, of businesses uh, and also, like I mentioned in the end, try to uh, show some examples from the library world. First though, I want to emphasize uh, Flickr, which is a photo sharing uh, site that uh, you probably all know. Um, like when you upload your photos to Flickr, you can, uh, uh, by default, you're given uh, you know, full copyright, of course, but you can actually also uh, say specifically that you you would like your images to be licensed under a Creative Commons license and choose which one. Um, and this is something that a lot of people are doing. I think, I think 250 million images on Flickr, which is only 2%. It's a huge database, but still 250 million pictures are licensed under CC. Um, why do people do that? I mean, for a lot of people that don't want to make money from the picture, they just want to make their images available to the world. But even professional photographers do this. They, they add their photos, they put them usually under, like a lot of photographers put them under a non-commercial license, which means that everybody can use them freely, but anyone else uh, that wants to make money from them has to pay. Uh, because that way they make their images available for, for instance, blogs. And they take advantage of the network or the readership that a blog has. Like, if you are an editor of a blog, you probably know that. I know some of the libraries run blogs, right? Do any of you uh, edit a blog? Some? Yeah? Do you consider when you use an image that, you know, is this legal or not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot, of people, a lot of people don't, but I mean, if you actually should, because you know, we, we have these uh, examples of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, pictures that have to be taken offline and compensation has to be paid, etc. So in a way, you have to make sure that an image is, is legal. Um, so going back to these professional photographers on Flickr that upload images, by making them available for uh, non-commercial blogs, they, they reach a whole new target group. There are lots of, of uh, examples of uh, pictures being picked up by blogs and then subsequently from that blog 
getting picked up for a major newspaper. And that major newspaper would never ever uh, have seen the image if it hadn't been uh, in that, you know, that block that they happened to stumble upon. So, you know, that, that's the whole idea in general. Like, as a creator, if you want to reach a larger and larger audience, then you need to make your material uh, able to travel the tubes of the internet. Because reaching, it, um, it's one thing that you know a lot of people have called them and say, here's my image. But if, like, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's a finite amount of people that you can actually reach. But if you, you know, let people uh, redistribute your image to their friends and their business contacts, and you know, all these contexts are the same, then all of a sudden you, you reach a, a much larger, a larger audience. So Creative Commons for photography <coughs> using Flickr is a great way to you know, reach a large audience and make a profit you know, from actually making your picture, your image, your photo available to the world for most people to use for free. Uh, next example is Wikipedia. <coughs> which is the, the biggest information resource in the world. A magnific magnificent website. Um, as you all know, anyone can edit Wikipedia, and they use a, a attribution share-alike license, which means that anyone can use the text or the information that you find on Wikipedia, as long as you remember to say where you found it. And also that you, you know, uh, as the license says, share alike. You have to share this information under the same license when you use it. Um, third example, <clears throat> um, this is the website of the current American uh, administration, which uh, all the way from the beginning of the campaign uh, used CC licenses on legal documents. Uh, this was uh, uh, relatively radical in the US because uh, a lot of, of uh, uh, governmental agencies are very closed and, and the information is not available, uh, but they have this, uh, I believe it's called Information Freedom Act or something, uh, where uh, they actually want to make information available to the public, and in doing so, they can use a Creative Commons license, because that way they are sure that this material is used in a way that they want it to be used. So also in you know the public, <coughs> the public space, in you know, the uh, public uh, agency world, CC licenses is, uh, is a way to make information available to the public and make sure that people can obtain information from a, a, the right source rather than from derived sources that may, you know, twist the information or, you know, put a spin to it. So, so it's a way to actually make your information available to the world, also as a, a, a government, and make sure that people have a good source to go to. Moving on into the fourth example. This is a really excellent example. This is a, a news broadcast. You all know Al Jazeera, which is an Arab world-based news network that uh, produce a lot of content, a lot of video, a lot of uh, news broadcasting um, for cable, but also online. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you uh, watch TV online, like streaming TV. Does anyone? Uh, that's often quite difficult, don't you think? Like you have to, you know, register and you also have to pay a monthly fee often and then you have the, uh, the problems of compatibility, like if you are a Mac or Linux user, then you know, you can't play or you're in another country and it tells you after you pay, and after you register, oh by the way, you cannot watch Danish TV when you're in Germany. <laughs> I, I, I lived in Berlin for a while, and this was really frustrating. Like, I, I paid and everything. I, I followed the rules, like, but I still I couldn't watch. I think they, you can actually do that now for the Danish uh, public broadcast. Like, uh, you know, it's just really, really weird. Like, you, have a, uh, you, have a, you are a news agency. You live off people looking at your content. You want to reach as many people as possible. You want to be as influential as possible. Then we have a new technology coming in. Then you close it down, make it difficult and almost unusable for people. But that doesn't make any sense. And this is some of the this is some of the the, the 
the, the, the thoughts that Al Jazeera as a news broadcaster have had also. Al Jazeera is, is a, a, really a pioneer in the use of open licensing. So what they do is, for most of their material, is they make it available under a CC BY, a CC attribution license, which is the most open license, uh, make it available to the world for download, uh, not all of it under that open license, but a lot of it, um, and let people uh, remix it, sample it, <coughs> redistribute it, uh, cite it, quote it, uh, you know, post on their blogs, do whatever, um, in order to you know, gain a bigger audience. Like the, that's the thing for, for news broadcasts. You want as large an audience as possible because it boosts your credibility and it also boosts your influence, uh, you know, from even a political point of view. So Al Jazeera did this. They posted this huge uh, repository uh, online under a CC license and still do so. And what happened was, for instance, under the recent Arab Spring, uh, uprising in Egypt when they uh, put the CC license on their uh, content from, from uh, or the news broadcast from, from there, um, the traffic to their site jumped by over 700%. This just shows that this is what people want. This is what users want. We want to be able to access material and consume it as well as share it and in that sense become the ambassadors for the news broadcast. Like when you share something, then you're actually helping the person who created it. And that also goes for a TV network. So in that sense, it's, it's, it's something that should be encouraged, I think. And this is, this is the rationale behind, the, behind what Azure Serious does, what it's doing. Um, fifth example um, is in, within the movie industry, an animation film called Sita Sings the Blues, made by a woman named Nina Paley who added a CC license to her movie in order, as she was, she didn't have a marketing budget, but she wanted to reach as many people as possible. And this is a really great story, and mainly because the movie is great. But the, the, the way it happened was that all of a sudden she reached a huge audience. Like people shared the movie and they recommended it to their friends. They check out this movie, here's the link, download it. And people did so, you know, and, and redistributed it to their friends. Yeah. But from a business point of view, it was also great because from all this attention, like all this, uh, uh, all this traffic, like all this redistribution, uh, redistributing of her film, all of a sudden it also started reaching movie theaters and TV networks, etc. All these people that you normally wouldn't be able to reach, but they they discovered the the, the, the film from blogs and hype and figured, okay, so we need to we need to screen this. And that way, she actually also made business from making her movie available for, for a non-commercial share. Uh, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, another way to, to build a business, uh, even if you're in the movie industry. And as a side note, I would also like to emphasize how um, uh, amazing the internet is sometimes, especially uh, with this example, because uh, a community that has grown all over the world is uh, the open subtitling community. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But it's basically people who subtitle movies in their own native uh, language if that, you know, those subtitles are not already made professionally. Um, this is awesome because you, could, you, like, you can make a Danish film and you probably wouldn't uh, necessarily, anyways, uh, you know, translate or make subtitles or have distribution in a country such as uh, you know yeah Thailand or it could actually be Thailand, maybe smaller countries. But by making you know enabling people to subtitle the movie and distribute it in a way so that people can have access to it, then that way if the movie is good you can actually create a market in countries uh, with languages that you would normally not give priority to through a normal distribution. Uh, company. So that way you can reach, I know there are uh, examples of movies that have reached over 200 languages without an intermediate company to actually provide the, the network and the distribution service and charge a lot of royalties for doing so. Only simply by making the movie accessible to people and let them do the subtitle. I actually know a lot of the larger movie studios are really cracking down hard 
an open subtitling because it's not controlled. And that just, that puzzles me. Like, why would you do that? People actually help you distribute to countries that cannot understand what is being said in, in English, so they help your movie reach a new audience. So you put them in jail. That's really weird. Okay, so the last example is the music business. And this is where I'm producing also one of my own projects as, a, as an example. But first, I want to just show you a really successful, oh, this is hard to read, a really successful use of CC license within music. Uh, how many of you know the band uh, Nine Inch Nails? Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty famous band. And uh, the guy, uh, the, lead, the lead person, Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor, is a really, really uh, uh, curious guy. And he figured, okay, so the internet is about sharing. And people want to share my music, uh, and not all want to pay for it, but how can I take advantage of the people that want to pay, or not take advantage, but, but actually provide them with, with what they want to pay for, while still using the internet sharing capacity and combine the <coughs> two things. So what, what he did was he made this album called Ghost uh, 1 to 4 and put it out under a CC license for everybody to download uh, before the release. And since this is a big band and everybody was really excited about the new album and so forth, it was just a, it was like a stampede. Everybody downloaded the album. So, so from a, a, a traditional music business perspective, you would not have uh, people would not want to buy anything after they had the music. But that's not the way it was. That's not, that's not true because uh, Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails also provided people with premium products that were available uh, for purchase. So you can get the music for free, but you could also get these premium products. And as you can see here, you can read it, but there are all these different kinds of categories of limited edition vinyls, CDs, DVDs, booklets. Um, I think it's not on here, but I think there was actually also a Super Deluxe Ultra <laughs> where the band came to your house to play. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I think there are only two or three, and they cost a fortune. Like a fortune. But they, like they sold out in five minutes of that category. You know, which, which kids' parents will, I don't know. But uh, still. So with all these products available, um, they were actually, these products were now also exposed to a much larger target group. All the people that downloaded also became aware, okay, so I have all this stuff that I can also buy. And most of them didn't want to, they just wanted music and left. But uh, a small percentage actually wants some more stuff. And if that was, you know, the group that this percentage, is take, uh, this percentage is taken from is large enough, then the small percentage uh, is huge. And here are some numbers. So it says, a week after the album's release, the official Nine Inch Nails site reported over 750,000 purchases, or purchase and download transactions, amassing over 1.6 million in sales. This is, this is a quite a high number in these times of uh, piracy and whatever people call it. And this is simply because he provided people, first he reached a huge group of people, and then he provided what a small percentage of the people actually wanted to buy. That's a business model that uses the internet sh sharing capacity while uh, also focusing on sustaining that career. So I know most of you may be thinking, okay, well, you know, it's easy for them. They were famous before, you know. So, you know, it's just that they had all the attention beforehand. But this is uh, where I move into my next example, which is an experiment that I myself was part of, um, which is not really interesting, but it's interesting because that means I can provide you with all the details. Um, and, uh, and starting three years ago, me and some friends decided to start a record label. And uh, we didn't really, actually before that, maybe four or five years um, ago, and um, so we did the round trying to get a distributor, Etc. Etc. Uh, all, all closed doors, and you know that's the bottleneck of the music business, and that's you know nothing wrong with that, as such. But it just meant that we couldn't release the music. So we started looking into okay, so Creative Commons, how could that work? Um, and we uh, we uh, the, the, in the group was a really talented girl uh, who uh, went by the artist Tom, who said okay, I would love to actually be 
you know, experiment uh, and, and actually use my career and see how we, how we you know, leverage that using these open licenses on the internet. <clears throat> so, um, so, you know, also learning from 90s mails, we figured, okay, let's try to make vinyls and CDs available in the stores. We actually did our own distribution, like calling all the stores ourselves. But basically providing, like, make the, 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 the units available to the stores and also releasing the, 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 the music as digital files um, to, to, you know, copy a little of what 90s mails did. Um, and this was kind of a big thing, like it was picked up by the national news, etc. So we had, uh, at, you know, when that happened, 6,000 downloads until the server went down, so we couldn't, people couldn't download it anymore. But then this Swedish guy, we don't know who he was, but we love him, because what he did was he actually sipped the album, made a torrent, and put it on Pirate Bay, and sent out a, a tweet or something saying, okay, here's the tone album, like, if you go to the side, it's down, but you can pick it up here instead. And you know, in a, again, in a traditional music business perspective, you would send your lawyer. <laughs> but for us, it was great. Like, people actually started redistributing our music, and even recommended it, said, check out this album, it's great. So we, didn't, we couldn't track how many downloads uh, came onto that. But that's not, I mean, that's not necessary. We don't care about control or tracking and all these things. We want to focus on making great music and making things that uh, people would like to enjoy. But what happened was then that apparently it's reached so many blogs that way, uh, and they liked it. So people got interested, downloaded it, and, and we uh, got you know, uh, contacted by a, a Berlin-based record company that would like to release the album all over Europe. And they were like, oh, we don't understand this Creative Commons license, but it seems to be working for you, so let's try it as well. So we got licensing internationally. We had uh, uh, inquiries for to use the music in movies, and in documentaries, etc. And you know, most significantly, we also toured heavily because all of a sudden, all these festivals from all over Europe became aware of this great artist through the grassroots channels uh, and figured, okay, let's let's uh, let's check it out. Oh, and they could do so because the, you know the files were open. They could check it out and say, okay, we like this. Let's call. Them. So in that sense, you know, of course you have to make some music that people like, but you don't have to be famous beforehand. Like if you if you make your data, your produce available to people and and they like it, then the machine of the internet will expose you to a huge audience. And then uh, you as an artist can create an income, not necessarily a fully sustainable like make a living from it income. But nevertheless, you can actually build uh, commercial uh, concepts on uh, <coughs> some, something like, like sharing. Um, so that's an example. Um, okay, so these were all uh, different kinds of examples. Uh, the last part, <coughs> how, what's the time? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, great. Um, now I'd like to move into something that is perhaps more relevant for this, this audience, namely the, the publishing and library areas. Um, this example is uh, an author uh, called Cory Doctorow. I don't know if anyone are familiar with him. He does sci-fi novels, really great ones too, I recommend. Um, but um, what is really great about Cory Doctorow is that he releases his books under a CC license um, so that you can actually download a PDF or an EPUB version. Not all of them are available as EPUB because he has a major publisher and they're still, you know, still struggling <laughs> with complete openness. But nevertheless, you can download a digital copy of his books, sometimes often an audio book, and then the print book uh, costs money and goes through the traditional channels. Um, and the, the books you see here, this is just select books really, but the front one, Little Brother, um, went on to sell enough to reach the New York Times bestseller list. Even if the digital book was available for free, or perhaps more accurately, because the book was available for free. Because all the blogs that you know, discuss sci-fi novels picked it up, posted it and said, check it out, immediately people downloaded it and started reading. You know, one, two chapters in, like, okay, I need this book. Amazon.com, order. 
So uh, Cory Doctor does talk too, talks too, where he explains the math behind saying that the more I open, the more I sell. And you know that's that's just the way it works for him. Of course, now he has a reputation, so everybody knows how it works when he does a new book. Go in, download it. I haven't bought all his books because I don't like. I read a couple of chapters online, and not all of my life. But nevertheless, I every time he does something, I'm there. And this is this is the sort of, of relationship you want to create with your with your you know the people, your fans or whatever, to actually connect with them and you know give them permission to try and then sell some, something to those who want to, to buy. And that's what he does. And I actually have, I have two quotes by Cory Doctorow. I'm going to read this. It says, uh, I believe that we live in an era where anything that can be expressed as bits will be. Uh, I believe that bits exist to be copied. <clears throat> Therefore, I believe that any business model that depends on your bits not being copied is just done. And that lawmakers who try to prop these up are like governments that sink fortunes into protecting people who insist on living on the sides of active volcanoes. I guess that's the Icelandic, but um, I like this quote because he's right. We're trying to, to create a business model that goes against the greatest technology that we created in the last 50 years is just done. Next one, shorter. It says, the good news for writers is that it means that e-books on computers are more likely to be an enticement to buy the printed book, which is, after all, cheap, easily had, and easy to use, than a substitute for the book. And this is the mechanism that we're trying to, you know, pursue in the publishing world. Like I myself, I'm a, I call myself a net activist, and I believe in everything being open, but I still buy tons of paper books. I really like that format. So, but you know. Before I buy a book, I'd like to try it out, and I know I can go onto Amazon and read a page or something. But like, I have to be online, I have to be by my computer, or all these things. I'd much rather just you know download it, download it, and, and use it the way I want, check it out, and then I'll probably buy it if I like it. And I buy a lot of books. <sighs> okay, so that that was an author. Let's then move into the libraries. So I I've, I've tried to dig out a couple of examples that I find interesting for this session. Hope you do too. The first one is the University Library of, uh, or the Library of University of Michigan, who recently added a CC license to uh, three uh, million items of uh, bibliographical data. Uh, it's usually indexes, uh, reviews, uh, all these uh, metadata about books. Like they cannot apply a CC license to the actual books. That's for the publishers to decide. But the data leading to the books were put under a CC uh, license because, uh, of course, they wanted to, you know, grasp the new world and see where that could take up, take them. Um, but also on a more, you know, grander scale, uh, on a more societal, societal uh, or common good scale, they also wanted to contribute to the common good by collecting, organizing, preserving, communicating, and sharing the record of human knowledge. And this is, you know, the way I see libraries is that it's also a matter of, of uh, you know, seeing it as a resource for society. That it's a matter of, of uh, making sure that the knowledge that's being produced in, in your country or even in all countries is, you know, preserved and made available to people. That people can actually access it and use it in a way that is, uh, you know, complementary to the way people use technology nowadays. So the way that they see it at the, this library in, in Michigan is that they also see it as their uh, role in society to make sure that this huge, vast uh, repository of knowledge is actually brought up to date and is part of the lives of people. Uh, another example from libraries is closer Geographically, the British Library did pretty much the same thing. You know, put a CC license on these meta data for, for books. Um, and uh, the, the, the project leader of that, I can't remember his name, but uh, this is from the press release, said that we believe this vast data set of bibliographical records created and compiled by the British Library for many decades 
has a range of applications far beyond its original purpose. It's going to be exciting to find out the new uses that organizations and individuals can make of this data. I love this quote because it shows that they haven't even foreseen all the uses that you know, this data can be used for. They're not trying to, you know, trying to figure out beforehand, okay, what does people want with this data? Rather, they, they put it the other way around and say, let's make these data available and see what people can actually use them for. That's a real <coughs> resource in my perspective. That's a real way of giving initiative to the people and a real way of uh, um, you know, understanding what the internet is and understanding the culture that we're living in now new reality of interaction and creativity, of building upon each other's works and you know, being creative in your own sense based on other people's creativity. So the British Library saying, okay, let's make this data available to people and see what happens. It's going to be interesting to see if, uh, you know, what will come from it. Maybe in a couple of years there will be another great example of something that you know, grew from this. But uh, this, this is the idea. I think, I think I love this idea, you know, making things available to people and the libraries is just such a huge, huge resource. I would love it if the actual books were also made available like this. Searchable, etc. That would be really awesome. And on a side note, I also think that <coughs> uh, with all, most of us here being Danes, that's also a matter of, of uh, making sure that Danish culture and heritage as a small country is made available to the world. As it is now, the, the, the internet is uh, uh, very anglified, like it's English and Chinese. But in our world, mostly English. So the culture and the, you know, the information that is available online is mostly English and based in, in, uh, in Anglo, uh, yeah, Anglo cultures, which is great. I mean, we all love that. But I think it's also important that in Denmark, that uh, in a small country, that we make sure to claim our small part of the digital domain. Like whatever is in the real physical world of culture needs to be projected into the digital world, in my perspective. So that the world can play with our culture and learn about our, our ways. Same goes for Belgium and any country. Uh, we, need, we need to take initiative in bringing our culture into the digital domain. I don't think other countries will do it for us. Uh, yes, I think we're running out of time. I just, I, I had this last uh, bit, which is actually a video bit, but I hope we could see. It's a, a, a little, um, it's a little segment by a woman named Frances Pinter, who's a publisher with uh, Bloomberg, and um, it's eight minutes long. I'm not going to show the whole thing. I just want to play the first two minutes, and I'm hoping that this is talking about a new sustainable economic model for libraries. Because it's one thing to make everything easy, accessible, and free, but we also have uh, a cost of running libraries. And we also have a cost for publishers to release books. And this is what, uh, this is what she's talking about. I hope, uh, is the sound on? Hello, I'm Francis Okay, it works. Sorry, I'm just going to start it all over. Hello, I'm Frances Pinter. I've been in academic publishing all my professional life, and I'm worried. I'm very worried about the future of the book, in particular in the social sciences and the humanities. Like you, I've seen the benefits of the internet, but I've also seen how we might just be closing down access to scholarly works. If we continue as we are, replicating the old, print model in the digital realm, we're going to be exacerbating the digital divide. The sector that I'm looking at is what gets traditionally referred to as the book in the social sciences and humanities. Nowadays, probably better called the long-form publication. That's because in the digital realm, we can take the covers off the books and make them so much more. We've all been struggling. All right, it goes on. I just want to point out this quote. <clears throat> if we continue as we are, replicating the old print models in the digital realm, 
we're going to be exacerbating the digital divide. I think that's a great point. I would love for us to actually be able to see the, the whole video because she brings forward an idea, like a new global economic model for the running of libraries, referred to as the International Library Consortium. The idea being that rather than spending 80% of a budget of a book on distribution, intermediaries, uh, royalties, et cetera, <clears throat> the books, which is only actually 20% of the production cost total, should be made available digitally under a CC license <coughs> to all libraries across the world who could then order it for, uh, to make it available as a download, and then the publisher could pr uh, keep producing print copies. And those libraries that actually felt that this title was so popular that it could sustain uh, a, print, uh, a print catalog in their current library could then order it. But the whole thing about making all books available for all of humanity through the libraries would ensure that all books in a digital uh, copy would be, or a digital <coughs> format would be available to all libraries uh, to, uh, to redistribute and for all of humanity to have access to. Imagine if all of humanity had access to all books ever made. Um, that's her idea. And uh, I hope maybe I can send the link to you this and yes. we can send it out. You should watch these eight minutes. After this part, she goes into the map, you know, calculating how this could actually work, how you know cost of running libraries could be cut to 20%, and how all books could be made possible uh, or accessible for, for everybody. Thanks. So we run out of run out of time. So we not, not not too many questions. I don't know if I can ask so many questions. Anyone? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Well, Facebook is a you know story of its own. I'm not even on Facebook. But that's because I'm an idealist. But um, you probably all know how how Facebook has these really harsh privacy settings that you most users are not aware of, like how you sign off pretty much any right you have of the material you post for them to exploit uh, extensively, uh, and they do it. You know, they do exploit it. Uh, and uh, I mean, some people are okay with that, and I'm not gonna you know tell people not to be on Facebook. That's not the point. But I think uh, like people should be aware of what they're signing up for. And we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. Also in terms of uh, in Google, etc., like these really powerful uh, entities of, of uh, social media and search, how they actually you know, come forward as these altruistic uh, services that are free to use. But of course, there's an underlying business model that takes advantage of uh, the users. Like this is a real fun quote, um, talking about some of these services. They say, if it's free, that means you are the product. And people don't realize that. I, but and I guess it's, it's, it's okay. Like, I use other social media services, so it's not like I, I want to say people shouldn't. But read the small letters. Yeah, just a remark if you compare Wikipedia. It's not so really a public utility model. It's yeah. a non-profit that yes. runs it. And the only thing they need is to have enough donations to keep it running. Exactly. And so they don't need to exploit you if you use Wikipedia. So there are alternative models available yeah. if you would want to. Yeah. But we don't have to have corporate platforms yes. that need to sell our privacy in order to exactly. make profit. You're right, yeah. That's a great point. Like, it doesn't have to be that way. So, I, you know, in closing, I, I try to do experiments, say, how, <coughs> how much would it cost? to get an, an advertisement on my screen using the, the, the advertisement the tool in Facebook. And uh, you can actually break it down into these really weird categories. Like, okay, so I want to target, like I live in Melbourne, so I want to target people between 30 and 35 living in the uh, western side of Melbourne, interested in horses and uh, you know, uh, scary movies, <clears throat> who has bought a book on Amazon within the late, latest six months, who, all these things, all the way into stuff like sexual orientation. All these really, really uh, shocking 
um, like organization uh, structures, how they actually structure it. And then they say, okay, there are four people like this in this area. And you're going to pay $16 per person. And if you press OK, then you're on their screen. It took eight minutes. Then you're actually on my screen. Like when I open my computer to do something which I feel is my social intimacy sphere, then anyone with enough money can be right there. And people don't realize that that is how it works. So you're telling libraries to use Facebook for... <laughs> I, I don't know, like Diaspora is an is a, is a alternative, it's a, like an, a, an open alternative to Facebook. But it's hard to gain traction, like Facebook is huge. And I'm, not, not, I'm not here to, uh, to, uh, to pick on, on Facebook per se. Maybe I'm just picking on uh, the way that some companies, such as Facebook, do business. Just a like of, I, I have a Thai TV station by the door, is that normal? Oh, uh, what, sorry? I have a Thai TV Thai, station, oh. and I, I live in Thailand, so I'm actually thinking they probably saw <laughs> that in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they made it available to my room. I, I think it's a pretty much Facebook-ish. Yeah, I guess. Because <laughs> 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 I don't think there's so many Thais in, in Denmark that you have. Yeah. Thai TV channel. It's a market. Right? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is my email address if you want to get in touch. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.